While reading The Lord of the Rings or watching the movies, you may wonder what role religion plays within the world of Middle-earth. It is a seemingly medieval setting and one whose author is known to have been an incredibly devout Christian and nonetheless, throughout the entirety of The Lord of the Rings, we see no organized religion, no priesthood, no churches or temples or worship and barely any mention of God himself, even though Ilúvatar's role within the story is central in every major event from the Council of Elrond all the way to the destruction of the One Ring with Gollum's accidental fall into the fire. In this video, we'll explore the history of religion in Gondor, what and how people worshipped, as well as the state of Gondor's religion at the time of the Lord of the Rings. For starters, it is important to mention that religion within Tolkien's legendarium is everywhere. Not only is it everywhere, but it is also an objective fact. God's actions within the world are described numerous times, and so are the actions of his angelic servants, the Ainur. Religion is everywhere because God is everywhere and his hand can be felt throughout the millennia worth of events that Tolkien has written, from the creation of the world all the way to its remaking with the renewed music of creation. Despite this, numerous religions that do not worship Ilúvatar have existed throughout the years, with some perhaps even overpowering, in numbers at least, what we just established as the true faith. These religions or cults were practiced by peoples who had been corrupted into the worship of the Dark Lord or simply by those who had not yet discovered the grace of Ilúvatar and were pagan. On the other hand, the people that were closest to the true religion were the elves with their long years, higher understanding and close contact to the Undying Lands. And it is the men that were closest to the elves that also inherited the knowledge of how the world actually functioned and who its creator was. The elves themselves, however, did not hold any particular religious practices such as certain ceremonies or holidays. And though they and the Valar did on occasion oversee special events in reverence to Eru, that was the extent of their religious life. And it is this culture of worshipping Ilúvatar that they passed on to the men of the West. These men before their contact with the West had been pagans and through the elves they had entered, as Tolkien puts it, into the world of monotheism. These men were the Numenorians, the ancestors of the people of Gondor. And as such, the history of the Gondorian religion starts with Númenor itself. Ever since its creation in Númenor, for the longest time Eru Ilúvatar was revered. His name was praised in worship during what was called the Three Prayers, ceremonies that took place throughout the year in which the people, led by their king, ascended the holy metal Tarma, the sacred mountain of Númenor dedicated to Ilúvatar, and they would pray and give a fruit offering upon the mountain's holy summit. These practices parallel the way in which the Valar worshipped Eru atop the highest peak of Taniquetil, the Undying Land's own holy mountain, with the ceremonies being led by the Valar's king, Manwë. In Númenor, the extent of worship was this. There was no priesthood or a dedicated place of worship other than the holy mountain, and Ilúvatar was praised in ceremony only on very specific occasions. The Númenorians were a devout people, and they saw the worship of anything other than Ilúvatar as incomprehensible, and furthermore believed their king to be the only instrument that had the right to come into contact with the divine, which is why there were no priests. He was the only person with an official role within Númenorian worship. As such, to put everything in order, the Numenorean way of worship, even before the effect Sauron's cult had on the popular imagination, contained no temples, no priests and a culture in which Eru's name is not mentioned lightly, even when in praise, and is saved only for specific events that take place annually. Remembering this is very important for what followed. As I have covered before, the wealthier and stronger the Numenorians grew, the more afraid they became. With their long lives, they were able to amass more power, more power that they knew they were unable to keep, as despite their long lives, they were always destined to die and there was nothing they could do about it. When Sauron eventually ended up in Númenor as a captive following his defeat at the hands of Arpharazon, he was able to use that fear to corrupt them. He claimed that Eru Ilúvatar was a lie, that he didn't exist, that he was made up by the evil Valar who kept the Undying lands for themselves and maintain a selfish monopoly on immortality. He fooled them into worshipping the Dark Lord Morgoth and convinced them that only through their faith in him, in the darkness, they would be able to claim life eternal and power never ending. Sauron became chief advisor to the king and took the role of high priest of this new religion of Melkor and this was the first alteration to the original way of Numenorean worship. The king was no longer the only individual that played a role in Numenor's religious life. Moreover, he made the entrance to Númenor's natural and traditional place of worship, the Holy Mountain, illegal and punishable by death, and in its stead, Númenor's first ever temple was opened in the City of Kings. 
In that wretched temple, he first burned Nimloth the Fair, the White Tree of Numenor, and later even people were sacrificed in its dreaded altar, with its giant dome emitting the black smoke that the remains of the victims produced. This temple was the second major alteration to Numenor's traditional worship, with the third of course being the change itself of who Numenor worshipped, whereas before it was the one true god, now it was essentially the devil. At the culmination of all this, Sauron convinced Arpharazon to amass the greatest armada in history to invade Valinor and claim immortality by force. As he and his fellow mortal men set foot upon the Undying Lands, however, the Vala returned the governance of the world back to Eru Ilúvatar himself, and he swallowed the blasphemous king beneath the ground and utterly destroyed the island of Númenor, drowning and then wiping it off the map, as well as removing the Undying Lands from the physical world, which he turned from flat to globe. This is where the story of Gondor comes into place. The very few survivors of Númenor's destruction were a group known as the Faithful, who fled the Dying Island on nine ships. They were led by Elendil and his sons Isildur and Anarion, and they founded, in the westernmost part of Middle-earth, the Númenorean realms in exile, Gondor and Arnor. The Faithful were called such because they had remained faithful to their friendship with the Elves and the Valar, as well as the original faith of Númenor. The people that founded Gondor had retained their reverence to Ilúvatar, and because of this, they had suffered immensely under the tyranny of Arpharazon, Sauron, and the cult of Melkor. It makes sense then, how in the new realms that they established for themselves, they not only reverted back to the original way of Numenorean worship that I highlighted before, but they did so radically. Sauron's dark religion had left such a bitter taste in their mouths that they would forever be opposed to any mention of temples, priesthoods and the worship of anything or anyone openly, as it reminded them of the manner in which Melkor was worshipped back in Númenor. In Gondor, the king continued to be the only person that reserved any role at all in worship, though the people of Gondor, according to Tolkien, still preserved a vestige of thanksgiving to Ilúvatar. There were, however, no prayers as we would think of them today, nor any real sacred places dedicated to God. A hallow did exist on Mindoluin, that only the king could approach, but as the year passed following the fall of the last king of Gondor, even that place was forgotten. The white tree withered, and as the steward was no king, anything left of a priesthood or institutional and organized worship of God in Gondor was long gone. Therefore, by the time of the Lord of the Rings, the people of Gondor are a people distraught. They retain their faith in God, but they exist within a society and culture that is deeply afraid of worshipping him outright, and without a king, they are left without a spiritual leader. Tolkien has stated that Middle-earth is a monotheistic world, a Christian world, during a pagan time, and it is during this pagan time that God is worshipped in a way that Tolkien describes in Letter 156 as negative, and it would only be when Numenorean influence had disappeared that God would be worshipped in a way more familiar to us. Nonetheless, examples showcasing the faith of the Gondorians and Numenorians in exile are of course the few times they ever do mention Eru, in the most sacred and important oaths of all. Despite the obstacles they have faced in their worship, they do genuinely revere him, and they speak his name only in the most important matters. As Feanor swore in the name of Ilúvatar to reclaim the Silmarils from Morgoth, so did Elendil swear an oath to Eru above all to bind the last alliance of elves and men. And in a perhaps even more famous example, it was in the name of Eru Ilúvatar that the oath of Errol was spoken, and through which Rohan was founded, and the two kingdoms swore eternal friendship with one another. There was not a single thing more serious than an oath spoken in the name of Ilúvatar, and to break it would be unimaginable to his faithful. Lastly, when Aragorn assumed his rightful place as king of the reunited kingdoms, that sacred place atop Mindoluin close to Minas Tirith was remembered again, and in it he found another sapling of the white tree, descended from Nimloth itself, which was thought to be gone forever. In letter 156, Tolkien explains that, it is to be presumed that with the re-emergence of the lineal priest kings, of whom Luthien the blessed elf maiden was a foremother, the worship of God would be renewed, and his name or title be again more often heard, but there would be no temple of the true God while Numenorean influence lasted. As you can understand now, the matter of religion in Middle-earth is a complicated matter, and a question may arise. Why did the good guys of Tolkien's world worship the Christian God in the wrong way? Why did Tolkien write the aforementioned? Why was there no church or priesthood or any traditional way of worshipping? 
Well, Middle Earth, according to Tolkien in Letter 183, is supposed to be a long past imaginary period within our own human history, in our Earth, and Eri Luvatar is supposed to represent, within the fantasy, actual God meaning God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit that Tolkien worshipped. When you consider this, the answer for why the Numenorians and their descendants worshipped in this way becomes quite clear. It would have been improper, impractical and perhaps even sacrilegious for Tolkien to suggest that humanity had a Christian church or an organized Christian religion before the coming of Christ and before the actual founding of the real Christian church and though in parts of his letters he likens the Numenorians to the ancient Jews in terms of their path and certain aspects of worship, it does not become deeper than that. As such, Tolkien presents the Numenorians and Gondorians, the good guys, as worshipping in the best way that they can within the context of the otherwise pagan world that they inhabit before the coming of Christ. While Numenorian influence lasted, this would continue and it would only be broken when the course of history that Tolkien knew came into fruition. Thank you very much for watching.